Sometimes it's easier to draw lines. Sometimes it's easier to sketch. Um, needs to be dynamic. You know, you want to be able to make an adjustment to your decision because rarely are people placing where they want immediately, I mean, placing it correctly immediately every time. Want it to be fast enough that you're not sitting there waiting. And um, that's supposed to say border precise. And what I mean is where you draw the line is where the boundary is. So you're not limited by the topology underneath. Predictable and stable, meaning what you see in your visualization is what you get when you um, actually get the result and stable and doesn't crash. So I made this little chart of how I consider all these and um, our custom solution, I think ended up being pretty well, except that it's all in Python. And so it's, the stability is dependent on the intelligence of its developer. So that's fair. Um, everything else, I have some videos that we don't need to watch, but that outline some of the difficulties in each of these. So those are there for your reference, but short mo short, the short, um, the short version of those can be summarized here. And why I decided to invest so much time and effort into just one step is because there's so much, so many um, requirements not handled by the, the built-in Blender tools. Okay. However, uh, with one exception. So the sculpt mode limitations are good enough that it's still extremely valuable to, to leverage sculpt masking for segmentation. Um, and this is being, this, this was solved with add-ons before, and I've got some references in, in, in the notes of the slide that you can check. Um, but this is becoming built into Trunk, um, especially in the 2.8 sculpt branch where you can paint a region and then split it off. And, and so I'm really excited about the direction that that's headed. So let's. In this example, we're using a custom modal operator to uh, leverage Blender's sculpt masking tool to segment pieces of a mesh. So it's great in that it's very quick. I believe this is also graphics card optimized. The brush behavior... We're going to skip this because of time. Um, short story, you paint it and you get that, that, that region out. All right. And I think... We'll watch this on mute. And I'm hoping we can fast forward a little bit. So I already demonstrated. Um, and this is uh, freely available on my GitHub account. This is the base operator that I then skin and, and add the UI to to use in our, in our prescribed workflows. But this is kind of my prototype of a segmentation module and how I'd like it to work. Um, where you can where you can sketch, you can draw, you can paint, and the big thing, which if I had a um, a toolbar here, I would uh, uh, let's do this here. You know, by the time I get there, it's just going to be there. Um, where you can paint your regions. And then after that region is painted, the border is interpolated. And you can, you can move freely between painting and sketching and, and boundary marking. So in that case, we're boundary marking. Um, and well, we're committed now. So, so. I'm, I'm wondering if it's actually streaming slowly or if that's just how slow I work. I think we're definitely having a... Okay, we're going to have to... We'll, we'll cover that at the end if there's any more questions about that. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to talk about was offset surfaces. And these are so common um, that... I mean, they're just like a fundamental part of, of making 3D printed orthotics and things. And the main ways you can do that, you can manually extrude your geometry. Um, you can use the solidify modifier or the displace modifier, and that's kind of what's built in. And then the big problem with it is self-intersecting geometry. And occasionally you get little edge artifacts. Um, so in this, in this situation, this is the solidify modifier. 
And anywhere you have convex and concave geometry close to each other, you get these self-intersections, which make the mesh uh, virtually unusable in 3D printing or Boolean operations. And so we solved that by using a volumetric approach, which you can't create self-intersections, and we use metaballs. And um, I know I've got some metaball fans in here. So that link right there is a link to Alex's presentation um, about the basics of how they work, because he has a great introduction. So we can skip this video that's kind of about metaballs and jump right to the results that we get and kind of how we did it. So on the left is our solidify modifier, and on the right is our metaball generated offset surface. And we've got, it's great that we don't have any self-intersections, and but beyond that, we have some things that we really have to wrangle to make them behave. Um, so the offset surface, kind of the thickness of it depends on how closely you pack the metaballs together. So if you're trying to get a precise offset, it's, you can't just add the same radius of metaball or you won't get what you expect. Um, it's a little bit non-uniform because we're just jamming a whole lot of spheres all over the surface. And um, so we do some smoothing and some like ray casting and correction to try to get it as uniform as possible. But most of our applications, we don't need extreme precision on being exactly a certain distance offset from the anatomy. Um, you'd like to get it within a, a tenth of a millimeter, but beyond that, in this case, it's, it's not necessary to go beyond that. And the other thing is that the borders are a little bit rounded. So the metaballs here, it's hard to create a very stiff, squared off um, result, which in, for my application is fine. That's actually a bonus, but if, if you're just characterizing it, um, that could be non-desirable. So how do we scatter these metaballs um, in a way that gives us a result that we want? Is I take the, the, the mesh patch that you create with your segmentation, and then I use the dynamic topology um, detail flood fill operator to evenly distribute points and generally that works pretty well and the way I control that is if you plot one over your Dyntopo resolution versus the average edge length so I just took some models and made a little scatter plot and it looked pretty linear so I stopped there and so I use this little equation to pick my Dyntopo resolution based on my target edge length and then the target edge length is your target spacing between metaballs. Okay, so then I repeated the same process, but with the offset surface based on the edge length. And so then I could kind of, I've got two little equations that I can play with and, and get approximately even offset surfaces. So um, I've been doing, I uh, first started with that in 2016 and then just been slowly improving that. And I, I would have presented it earlier, but I wasn't able to get to the conference. So because the, the keep the sum, the, the punchline at the end of this is that all this work's about to be completely made irrelevant by 2.81, which I love. Um, it's, so it's great that we did it. It got us three years of doing something that wasn't possible otherwise. Um, so we use this to hollow 3D printed models. So you save, um, you know, this stuff is a couple dollars per milliliter. So you save a lot of costs by hollowing these out. Uh, we use metaballs to create these print rafts. Um, so like this raft back here allows you to stack a lot of models on the build platform and, and print them or in, an, in a different way. So we use it, we, we really abuse metaballs and I love them and but soon they won't be as necessary. Okay, I'm going to pause here. It's uh, 4.30 and if anyone's going to the, I think there's another talk in the theater. I was going to pause and let anybody out who's had enough and Go, yeah, oh, thank you. So I've got a few more slides for the people who want to stay. Yeah. Okay, it makes it highly unlikely. 
I mean, <laughs> I have this book with different kinds because we have different kinds of data for what we are producing, which means emission, mm -hmm. and it depends on the re resolution. So if right. you really try to nail every single different aspect in your data, you want okay. you are going to get set up. Set Agreed. So okay. I just like to highlight that's fine. For completeness, that's true. So the the comment is that if you try hard enough, you can get self intersections with metaballs, and uh, <laughs> that's. Okay, so at this conference, who, who I'm watching um, is listed there, so check that out if it's interesting. Um, some of the areas where I think 2.8 and 2.8 with add-ons, I mean, offset surfaces are going to get extremely easy with the open VDB remesh modifier. So offset, um, sorry, solidify modifier plus VDB remesh, done. So it's going to be fast, it's going to be built in, very scriptable. Um, so the, like all my meta, but the thing it can't do, um, to my knowledge, is if you make a hollow object, so it has thickness, but it's got an interior void, uh, VDB will keep it solid. So our hollowing of 3D printed models is still going to require meta balls. Okay, and jumping back to my goals when I set out, um, we're definitely accomplishing number one. Um, pe the feedback has been good. We're uh, less than a tenth, sometimes a twentieth of the cost of some of the same softwares that can do these night guard designs. Uh, we've supported the Blender Foundation, and I want to talk a little bit about the other things that we've made that, have re that we've released. So, um, so it was a super, super honor to have like my logo um, up there on the screen in the keynote this morning um, next to a lot of big names. And what we do is we we contribute 10% of our off the top sales. So before costs anything, 10% goes straight to the um, to the Blender Foundation. And I think that's um, pretty significant considering the amount of work it takes. Um, so the question is, is it going to be sustainable? I don't know. Um, the first two years, or it's like it's enough to continue the hobby. And once you reach a steady state, we'll see if we can actually keep people paid, keep developing, and and um, at the moment, it's been completely rewarding from the project point of view, and I th we'll find out. Um, so that's the only question mark on the goals. And now let's show some um, some cool stuff. So let me. So these are some of the um, add-ons that we've developed that are freely available, and who I worked with, and um, when we did it. So I think I'd like to show the metaball sculpting, the particle sculpting and then maybe poly trim and the segmentation, or what y'all want to see, um, or if we want to, so we've got 12 minutes before we probably need to clear out for the next presenter, maybe maybe 15 if we're, depending on how eager they are. So I'll, I'll pause and ask, is there anything that, from what I showed, particularly interests you? Um, or do you want to leave it up to me? Okay, here we go. Uh, yes, yeah, so my users are predominantly dentists and dental lab technicians. Um, many who have zero 3D experience, sometimes sometimes a little if they came from a commercial package. Ah, so... Okay, so the question was, how hard is it to convince dentists? Um, I don't really don't do any marketing, so most of my convincing is done, it's pre-filtered. People who come to me have already convinced themselves, so I don't know. Um, my big struggle is someone who really wants to is, is training them and getting them to where it is um, user-friendly and where they're the effort is worth, you know, becomes worth it in the time savings. Um, the reason we want to design these appliances like this is the traditional method. There's so many places for error. Model, plaster, a, a polymerization of the acrylic so that shrinks. Um, so it's a real bear of a procedure, even though it's very simple. Um, it's time consuming and it's the, it's not, it shouldn't be that expensive of an appliance. It's a piece of plastic. So uh, we've, with 3D printing, we've made it a lot more predictable. The fits are better. The, um, 
So we're getting there. They're not as durable, but so the, usually the convincing happens ahead of time. So by the time they get to me, I'm not trying to tell someone why or how, why they should be doing something. I'm saying, if you want to do this, here is one way how. So that's not. One more time. Uh, how many doctors would fish? No idea. No idea. Um, we have about 400 customers, and I don't know how. I know about. We have a. We have probably 20 like hardcore users using it frequently in a production environment. Um, another group of people who use it occasionally. Another group of people who purchased it, maybe tried it, forgot about it. Their printer broke. They didn't like it. I don't know. Um, It depends on your interpretation. So um, right now I have a flag where it's not for clinical use. But what a doctor does in their own practice is, is uh, unregulated. Uh, now for an, an occlusal a bruxism appliance is they have a code, but it's not classified, like a class 1, class 2, or class 3 device. So um, if you were to try to use these devices to treat sleep apnea or do anything where you jump into that class 2, then yes, definitely. Uh, right now, the area is gray, so we say, not for clinical use. What you do with it is up to you. You'll notice um, there were no clinical pictures. It's it's an academic and modeling application. <laughs> yeah, it's impossible to validate. Y'all need to see what I'm seeing. Okay, so here we have a an offset surface and then 3D teeth, and we want to blend those together in some way that looks kind of like something natural. So the first thing I'll show is um, our particle sculpting tool. So here we can sketch out a line and metaballs are distributed across it. And then this is my favorite one. Um, so we have a paint brush, and if you see those little particles in there, that will allow you to um, just paint offset surface onto whatever's underlying. Um, we can fuse that and then come back and continue to paint on top of it. As we change the radius of the brush, um, particles are filled in, uh, and those particles are evenly spaced, so that, that solves the packing problem. And we can, if we change the particle size and make it really small, um, there we go. Um, now we've got a super dense packing, although that might be overwhelming the, there we go. So overwhelming the solver. And then you can play with the resolution and everything. And, but now we've got kind of a nice um, interactive, and if we come back and, and turn this up, we can, delete. So this is kind of my prototype for how I envision a volumetric sculpting application. So I use this to add wax around the teeth and use this to, um, so if we come back and we wanted to simulate the gingiva, the gums around this tooth, we would do something like this. kind of paint here and then that starts to look kind of like gum tissue and then if you actually I plan to customize this where you can paint these metaballs onto the individual teeth ahead of time and then rearrange the teeth and the metaballs follow it so you get these dynamic volume calculated almost parametric gingiva all right so that's that So can you heal bad meshes? So yes, I have a, uh, yes with an asterisk. So I have a metaball remesh kind of thing where you just scatter it, you take the mesh result, and then you snap it back. So that really just becomes, so open VDB remesh, handled. Um, you can use, open VDB does not close meshes actually very well. 
So you should use the traditional remesh, which will close holes, but will not create good topology for self-intersections, and then VDB remesh it, and then you're good to go. You have to do it at high res to keep the detail. Um, so sometimes some decimation afterwards. Uh, segmentation of what? Gotcha. So the pink is a the pink is a is an offset surface from an optical scan of of a of an arch with no teeth. So some and the teeth are three D scans of existing plastic teeth that are then processed into dentures. Okay. So another difficult task is arranging these teeth. If if these teeth um, represent real objects that you're then going to snap into a 3D printed base, you can't have collisions between your teeth and your arrangement. And so you either have to make, go and check manually, or in our case, and this add-on is also available from the Blender Market. Um, my colleague, Chris Gearhart, he worked with me, for me, for um, a summer. That's kind of part of our model is I am hiring people to create assets that I want to use selfishly for my corporate business, um, but then we release the assets to be used um, for other things. So the segmentation module, this physics module, the wax, everything I've shown outside of the workflow um, is available for, for, at least for examination, and it's not really supported, but I'll answer emails, but you can get the code and play with it. And so that's part of the sustaining the ecosystem. Okay, we gotta show this. So what we've got right here is a, an animated loop with the physics engine running. And so when I grab and move these teeth, they are going to um, prevent self-intersections. And this is an older version, so there's a little bit of stuttering. Um, but what this ultimately will allow for is, imagine my curves, my splines that I was drawing earlier. You can get a proposal of where you want your teeth and then use the physics solver to make sure that your digital proposal is uh, reproducible with real objects. So um, I'm, pre I'm pretty excited about that because the same thing happens for, um, for you know, in orthodontic modeling, if you're trying to move teeth, you can't move a tooth through itself. So we, you can imagine a system where you're planning the rearrangement of the teeth and you're solving the physics collisions along the way um, so that you don't create an impossible trajectory for the tooth in your treatment. Um, again, that's something I can't touch because that you definitely, in a regulatory space, if you're trying to um, sell a product. But from a research point of view, like it's have at it. Um, okay, I think those are probably the two biggest ones I wanted to show. And I guess if we hide everything, I can show at 1044, we probably need to let the next presenter come in unless there's something burning that you saw from before that you want to know more about. Oh yeah, okay, I've got to re I have to return for a wedding. Um, so I'm leaving early tomorrow morning. So today, if you want to um, talk to me in person, tonight's the night. Um, but email, I mean, all my information's on the, the Blender Conference um, presentation page. Thanks, John. Yeah.